If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance. Declaring war on the New World Order. TruthRadioShow.com And welcome to TruthRadioShow.com. I'm your host, Dan Badandi. And welcome to the program here in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, our in-depth comprehensive study of the Bible. So like always, guys, if you actually, if you miss chapters 1 through 4, 1 through 3, yeah, 1 through 4, whatever case, go back and watch them to catch up. But anyway, uh, we do a Bible study approach, like always, and uh, very important to do this. That's why we do this at every single broadcast, because um, we can never forget. So this is like a ritual for me, you know, to do this, because um, the only way we can understand the Bible with its spiritual applications is through the Holy Spirit. So let's pray for wisdom and understanding. So Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, we come before you once again, and once again we ask you for forgiveness of our sins and um, anything we've bad we've done today, Lord, individually, that you can forgive us, Lord, and we repent of our sins and pray for forgiveness again. And Lord, just please forgive us for, because like, the world is just leads us into sin. The world leads us into all this decay, spiritual decay and everything. And we ask you to you know just bless us, Lord, and protect us with your precious blood. And Heavenly Father, we come before you and uh, once again asking for your help to give us the Holy Spirit to write your word upon our hearts today again. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in this amazing book. And uh, we ask you to give us great wisdom and understanding and protect us all from the forces of evil and send the great comfort of the Holy Spirit to comfort everybody that needs comfort. In your mighty name we pray, amen. And we read the scripture in context because context is key. Let the scripture interpret scripture. And let's begin. So if you're at ShakeAwakeRadio.com, thank you for tuning in. Miss Annie, thank you so much. Sister Ann, we love you. And uh, you know, I know people listen on here. I would encourage you to open up your own Bible. This way you can read it for yourself. And we're up on here on YouTube. So we got the Bible, King James, up on screen here. Uh, so First Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Uh, given uh, to Timothy to read to the, the Thessalonians chat. So continue on chapter 4, Paul says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. So uh, again, Bible meetings of things, so beseech, I like to, because words like this you don't hear every day. So sometimes I forget, which I just forgot what this word meant. <laughs> so like I say all the time, don't ever be ashamed to ask what a word means. In a Bible study, you know, so it's to ask or pray with urgency, to entreat or supplicate, to implore. So when we pray in supplication, with urgency. So furthermore, we beseech you in urgent, like urgency, talking to you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. That as you have received of us how we or you ought to walk and to please God. So we would abound more and more. So Paul's saying, yeah, uh, this is urgently, we're, we're trying to reach out to you, by the way. And exhort, exhort means to, where is it? Strongly encourage or urge somebody to do something. So, yeah, strongly urge you. We're strongly urging you to, uh, by the Lord Jesus, that you have received us of us that you ought no out. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I butchered that. So you ought to walk and please God. So we would abound more and more. And abound, and I know this might sound tedious to people with these words and all that, but you know you need to know what these words mean. Don't guess what they mean, uh, because, like, yeah, if you get the wrong meaning, you, it's going to throw off the whole word, verse there, right? Let me get that uh, Bible. Let's put the Bible here. So, a bow means in the Bible called to have great plenty, to be very prevalent, uh, to superbone, to exist in abundance, or increase in the argument. So, it's important, right? So, for you, know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. 
So again, commandments is, you know, there's uh, Jesus' two great commandments and there's the Ten Commandments of God. Specifying the commandments of God are the Ten Commandments. So every time you hear commandments of God, that's the Father, right? Those are the Ten Commandments. All ten, not just a couple, uh, all of them except for one. No, all ten. And the two great commandments are just summarized. Like The first great commandment hangs uh, uh, God's commandments one through four. The second uh, great commandment hangs God's commandments five through ten. Then under them hang all the laws. I know yeah, a lot of people in the modern day churches don't want to hear that, but yeah, plain and simple. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So the will of God, like because Jesus says we need to do the will of God, just as he does, does the will of God, right? Abstain from fornication. So that's sexual activity. Like fornication out of marriage. Now if you're married... Having sex with your spouse is perfectly good in the eyes of the Lord. And by the way, a man and a woman. Nothing else is considered marriage with the Lord unless it's one man, one woman. Plain and simple. So abstain from fornication, abstain from sex. Unless you're married. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessels in sanctification and honor. Possess his vessel. So we, which a vessel? We are the vessel. You're a vessel for the Lord. And sanctification means, let's get the Bible worth it. It's a, to set apart for special use or purpose. Like when the Lord, right, uh, Genesis chapter 2, right? God says he sanctified the seventh day. That means he set it apart from the other days. He didn't sanctify Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. He sanctified Saturday, the seventh day. He set that day apart for his day of rest, right? So that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. That's God in us, right? And sanctification and not to set apart, set apart yourself from the world, set apart yourself from the evil of this world. So you honor the Lord, not in the lust of uh, cons conspicuous, even as the Gentiles know which know not God. So let me see if I get this word here. <laughs> Oops. So let's see what this word means. I probably didn't even say it right either. <laughs> so uh, conspicuous is a passionate desire for something that God has forbidden. All right, so I had no clue what that meant. So if I would have skipped over that, it would have killed the entire, you know, verse basically. So having lust for something, you have passionate lust for something, a desire is something that God's forbidden. So all of us growing up in the sin nature, right? Yeah, especially us men. You know what I'm talking about, and I gotta keep it clean, all right? Your sinful heart, my sinful heart, right? When you see um, um, very provocative things, right? Your heart wants that, all right? Your sin nature wants that. I'm gonna leave it clean, and you ladies, you know, you, you go through the same thing, right? The lust of the world, right? Lust of the flesh, right? It's a passionate desire for something that God forbids. Even as Gentiles, which know not God. That no man, in, that no man go beyond the defraud of his brother in any manner. Because the Lord is avenger of all such. As we also forewarn you and testify. Defraud, right? And you should know what that means. 
So he has different, all these uh, things most of the time are different in the scripture. So defraud means to, in the Bible to deprave or property or rights to deception, trickery, or uh, artifice. So you denying somebody their rights to trickery and all that of your brother, like a person, in any manner. Because the Lord will avenge that. And we also forewarn you and testify. So Paul said, I warned you, okay, that if you defraud your brother, and that doesn't have to be your earthly brother, okay, it could be anybody, like a friend or a neighbor. If you defraud somebody in any manner, any matter, the Lord will revenge that. For God has not called us into uncleanliness, but unto holiness. So, the passion of lust, okay, let's just be straight out, us guys, right? And I, I speak for us guys because I cannot speak for a woman. Don't know how a woman feels, whatever the case. But I can clearly speak for us men. Our hearts, uh, you, you, the love of the flesh, or the lust of the flesh, is strong, okay, with us men. Especially with the world today, I mean, yeah, you you can't even go to a gym without some girl dressing provocative. Well, it's something that's shoving lustful things into your face. TV, radio, the whole nine yards, right? So, in your heart's desires, you, you know what I mean? You, things go through your head. Now, just leave it at that. And I have to use, I mean, that's why I keep using the sexual stuff, because this is what most men go through. So, I'm just being real with you guys, right? And I'm, trust me, I'm no, I'm no uh, innocent person. Daily I repent. Are you kidding me? So God has not called us uncleanliness. The filth that's out there in the world. Don't, you know, do your best to repent. From, get out of there. You know, you get, turn away if you have to. But he's called us to holiness. You can't be holy if you have the stuff in your heart. I go through a daily battle, guys, and I'm going to be honest with you. Daily. So it's something we all need to overcome. And some people have other um, things in their heart that they have to overcome, like uh, sins, like James, right? He struggled with them. So then David, look at all the wives and concubines he had. Solomon, the same thing. We all struggle, you know what I mean? And if anybody out there says, oh, I don't do that, then you're a liar. Unless you're um, the older age, uh, you, don't, you don't crave that stuff anymore. But he therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, and who has also given us unto the Holy Spirit. So again, he said, he therefore that despises, despises like to, like, not hate, but just uh, rebuke, right? Not man, but God, who also has given unto us his Holy Spirit. Let me see if that's the right word because I despise this. Contempt, scorn, disdain, have the lowest opinion of her. Yeah, all right, so that's what I, I thought it was because it was spelled different than what we spell it. So, um, yeah, so he therefore that despises, right, despises not man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Again, the first great commandment. And indeed, you do it toward all brethren, which are all in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Oops, I, I just caught myself. I'm sorry, guys. So the, there's the second great commandment. The first great commandment is love the Lord thy God with all your heart. So I apologize earlier because uh, I kept saying the first great commandment. The first great commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your soul. The second great commandment is love thy neighbor as you love yourself. So going back here, 
right? This took, this is the second great commandment. So, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That you may work, walk, I'm sorry, honestly toward them that are without. And they may need, may have lacked nothing. So, you say, you know, sorry I butchered that here. So that you, it always messes me up when I uh, got something on my mind because I'm like, is that was that the first or second great commandment? So I'm like, all right, it's the second great commandment. So that just threw me off the play, so I apologize. So yeah, to love your neighbor is the second great commandment. So yeah, I hate when it happens. Like I forget things or um, it's on my mind and I mess up for the rest there. So I just got to slow down here. So verse 12, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without. So people are without, right? And that you may have lack of nothing. So this is uh, more spiritually, like uh, like basically help people, right? And don't don't have lack of faith, have lack of nothing, right? Don't have lack, lack of faith and all that stuff right in the Lord. And you can help people that are without, right? So Because some people love God, but they lack faith. Some people love God and have faith, but they lack courage. You know what I mean? We're supposed to have it all. We're, you know what I mean? You don't lack any of it. When you're, in, you're trying to help people and all that in your faith, to have knowledge and uh, faith, courage, discernment, understanding. Again, there's many believers out there who don't have discernment. And it's unfortunate because, um, yeah, the average church goers on Sunday, guys, they don't have discernment on most stuff. These are the 501c3 mainstream media, um, I'm sorry, mainstream churchgoers. They're misled every week. They don't have the sermon, but do they have love for the Lord? Absolutely. Do they have faith in the Lord? Absolutely. But again, people, you know, we're supposed to have not lack of anything. You know what I mean? And we got to help people who do have lack of stuff. But I would not have uh, you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you are sorrow not, even as others uh, which have no hope. So he's saying, don't be ignorant. Concerning them which were asleep, what, you know, it's not physically asleep. The sleep means you're, uh, you don't know God. You don't have the knowledge thereof, of the scriptures or anything like that. That's what he's talking about, sleep, not, you know, going night-night. <laughs> uh, this is uh, people who just sleep out in the world. It's going about the daily lives, don't know God, don't know nothing like that. He says, don't be sorrow, don't, you know, be sorry. Have sorrow on them, say, don't have sorrow in your heart. Even as others which have no hope. So people who have, don't have hope, they have sorrow. They're full of sorrow. So don't be ignorant. And that means, like, uh, don't ignore them. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will be will God bring with him. So now this is a different sleeping now. So which even them, so so them also that sleep in Jesus, those are the people who are dead or in paradise right now, awaiting the resurrection. Will God bring with them? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And by the word of the Lord, what is he talking about? The word made flesh, right? Jesus. That which we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So again, uh, he's saying, like, um, I just want to go over this verse one more time. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, Jesus, the Jesus' word, that which we are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. So in today's world, we're alive, right? We're waiting for the coming of the Lord. And shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. This is talking about the end times. 
the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the, this here, this from point this point forward, going to Second Thessalonians. We got one more chapter after this, chapter five. Going to Second Thessalonians talks about the coming of Jesus Christ in details. And you're gonna clearly see there's no pre-tribulation rapture. Even the church is telling, oh, though Jesus comes for us, we're not gonna be here for the Antichrist, the mark of the beast. Well, guess what? That's not what the scripture says. And we're gonna show you that right from the word. So he, now he's getting to biblical end times here. And this is something they helped to see, and obviously it didn't happen when they were alive. Because the Lord said nobody knows the day or the hour, but the Father, right? Not even the angels know. So they, when Paul was alive, he was hoping for the coming of Jesus. The early church fathers that came later on, in their writings, they, they, they were hoping to see the coming of Jesus, right? All the generations that went on, every generation was, you know, the faithful were hoping to see the coming of Jesus Christ. But again, none of us know. And, and could we see in our lifetime? Very possible because um, the scripture gives you timelines. Does it give you a time stamp? No, that you don't know the day and hour. But the Bible says you do know the season because uh, when you look at the sequences of prophecies laid before you, you can see where we're about at. And we're right, right at that door. We really are. But there's still some stuff that needs to happen before the coming of Jesus. He lays it out what's going to happen. And when I get to this with the next two chapters after. I mean, the next chapter in the, uh, the book of Second Thessalonians, that's when we're really going to handle this. But he's giving people hope. The believers. And going back here, for this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, Jesus is the word, right? That you which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall prevent them which are asleep. Not prevent them. I mean, sorry. For the Lord himself shall descend out of heaven with shout, and with the voice of the archangel, Michael, right? And with the trumpet of God, that the dead shall rise, and Christ shall rise first. So people call this a rapture, or whatever case, and um, then people argue if it's a pre-tribulation, pope, mid, post, whatever. We're going to find out what the Bible says. And then which we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the year, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, again, at this time, obviously, like, this hasn't happened yet. This is what Paul was hoping to say, right? This is something that gives every believer comfort all through the generations. Because, again, nobody knows when he's coming. But if you, like, you know, end up dying, you know, before this uh, happens, right? This is giving you courage, too, because it said you'd be asleep in the Lord. That means when he comes, like, guess what? If you're, you're dead, you go to paradise, right? When he comes, you rise first. And if we're alive in, this, in the world here, right? We're going to see you rise first before we catch up to you. And again, he says, when this trumpet sounds, right? Now, we already covered this, so I can bring this up. Matthew 24, right? Jesus says, immediately after, after, not before, not in the middle, immediately after the tribulation, he returns. Right after that, he says, when the angel blows his trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise first. I'm sorry, he, it says it, he will gather his, his elect. He will gather his elect from all corners of the earth. Clearly stating the, that it's after, immediately after the tribulation. Not before, not in the middle, not toward the end. And the tribulation is seven, uh, not seven years. It's three and a half years. And Jesus said even then he'll cut those days short for the sake of the land. This is all, uh, we covered all this in uh, Matthew 24. And we got more details coming at the next chapter. 
and the next uh, book, Second Thessalonians. So from here out, we're going to hear a lot of prophecy, right? And again, then we who are alive, after the dead, Christ writes for us, right? Then who we which are left alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord forever. And wherefore, he says, comfort one another with these words. So right now, guys, if you've got um, a, a fellow believer, somebody who's new to a believer, or a lukewarm, whatever the case, right now, discourage what's going on in the world right now. There's a lot of crap going on in the world. Let's admit it, right? Comfort them with these words. Go read them and say, listen, it doesn't matter what happens in the world. Look, look, this is what's going to happen. And if you know what, and again, tell them, if you're not, you know, if you don't live to see the return of Christ, right? You will, you know, the sleeping Christ, which is uh, people in uh, paradise right now, right? When he does come back, you're the first one to go to see him before us living. So either way, this is a win-win situation. So again, obviously, Paul never seen this yet because Jesus didn't come back. I know the pre will say, oh, he came back in 70 AD. No, it's not the case. Obviously, you can tell because all the prophecies laid before us. We covered in Matthew and such that the prophecies have to happen first before Jesus returns, right? There's a sequence that happens to happen. It doesn't skip a sequence or whatever. These things have to have happen in sequences, right? In, in order. So comfort each other with these words. And as Paul did with these people in the Thessalonians, you need to do with other believers. And yourself, too. I, have, I mean, when I get, because I cover the news, doing these news shows and everything, right? I myself have to remind myself of this once in a while. Because uh, the media, the, the, it's an up and down roller coaster. So when you comfort each other and yourselves with these words, nothing matters at all. Doesn't matter what you're going through. It's like, oh, you know what? In the end, it's not going to matter because we're going to be with the Lord. And all this is going to be forgotten about. Let me put it this way in another way. All right. So imagine you're poor all your life, right? Struggled and all that stuff. And one day you hit the Powerball jackpot, right? You got millions of dollars. None of the, the poor stuff is going to matter anymore because you're like, you're living in luxury and all, and all that stuff. And I shouldn't use that, for example, because that's not what the Lord wants us to do. He wants to live, us to live modestly, you know what I mean? Here in the world. But with the Lord, we're going to live like gracefully. It's going to be awesome. So I should probably come up with a better example, but you get the point, you know what I mean? So anyway, guys, uh, thank you for tuning in. And if you like the broadcast here, hit the like, share, and subscribe, and all that good stuff. Uh, but don't take my word or anybody else's word for this. Read it for yourself. And if you need to get in contact me for any reason, truthradioshow at outlook.com. And check out our new show, uh, Spiritual Warfare Friday shows, our um, you know, Bible studies, our documentaries, and our links to NIC TV, FOJC Radio, Visual Disturbance, uh, Course Correction Radio, and so on. All right there on truthradioshow.com. So thank you for tuning in to this um, awesome chapter four of the book of First Thessalonians. So we'll see you for uh, the final chapter of the, uh, First Thessalonians chapter five before we move on to Second Thessalonians, which is going to be exciting because it gets into vivid details about the coming of the Antichrist and the coming of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ, which comes after the Antichrist, regardless of what your church is telling you. So, anyway, uh, love you guys. God bless. Shalom, and we'll see you soon, God willing. And you are the resistance.